invite you to settle in and get comfortable, allowing your eyes to soften their gaze and possibly even your eyelids drift downward. This will help clear our minds of any debris. And I wonder what comes into your mind's eye when I say the phrase anorexia nervosa. Your image may be influenced by your own personal experience with an eating disorder, or as a family member, or loved one, or classmate, or teammate, or neighbor, or acquaintance of a person with an eating disorder. It may also be influenced by your, what you've learned in school, what you've heard from friends, or what you've seen on TV or social media. But over the next 15 minutes, I hope to provide a different perspective of anorexia nervosa that gives us, I think, a better way to address it as an issue and how to help people recover. I'll start with presenting lessons I've learned over the last 40 years by listening to patients and parents and by giving them hope and the vision of a future that can be healthy. But what I'll also do is focus on how the developmental tasks a human development from age 10 to 20, commonly called adolescence, is inexorably linked to the development of anorexia nervosa. And so I hope that at the end of this, there is an idea that's worth spreading. So back in the 1970s, when I started my medical training, I had never heard the word, in eight years of medical and pediatric training, never heard the word anorexia nervosa. And so two weeks before I went to Rochester to start my adolescent medicine fellowship, I learned about a patient with anorexia nervosa who was admitted to the hospital. I intrigued, I went up to visit her, but, and she was in a single room, and the door was closed. And as I approached the room, I was told, oh, you can't go in there. Nobody's allowed in there except her psychiatrist and the gastroenterologist. And I kind of stepped back and said, well, is she contagious? I mean, we w she was in a single room, usually reserved for isolation, for infectious isolation. And I was told, no, no, no. No, she has a psychiatric illness. And I said, well, why is she on the GI service if she has a psychiatric illness? Well, she feels full when she eats a small amount of food. So I was really kind of struggling with that. It didn't make any sense to me. But I said, OK, I don't, I don't understand this, and I don't need to. I'll just forget about it. Until two weeks later, when I start my fellowship in adolescent medicine in Rochester, and my very first patient is a 15-year-old girl named Liz, who was eerily similar in her story to the person I was not allowed to talk to in Philadelphia. And now, She's my patient. My mind's eye was a blank slate. My mind an empty vessel. I had no clue what to do. And I think in that case, made me a little bit more open to what patients actually had to tell me. So I asked Liz, this doesn't make sense to me. Can you help me understand how you can feel fat when you are thin? And I very much intentionally avoided asking her to justify having an eating disorder. I said, it is possible for you to feel fat and for me to think you're too thin, but it just doesn't make sense. So as we talked about it, she helped me understand where she was coming from. It had to do with her sense of control, her sense of identity, the issue of going, going up through puberty, et cetera. And so I said, so what I hear you say is that you feel fat, true, and Based on my physical examination, your body is telling me it's too thin. True. It, it's not that you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong. We're both right. And between my hands is where your anorexia nervosa lives. Now, being an academic medicine fellow in Rochester, I learned from books, I read books, I learned from articles and teachers, that anorexia nervosa was considered a mental illness with up to 85% of patients affected being girls 10 to, 4, 10 to 20 years of age. And I learned that they had extreme restriction of caloric intake, an extreme amount of compulsive exercise, 
all intended to either minimize weight gain or maximize weight loss. And it did have a definite level of fatality. They could die from this. I was also warned that, you know, these patients, they will lie to you. They manipulate you. You can't trust them. And parents were so much at the core of the eating disorder that the term carotectomy, literally, removal of the parents from treatment, was considered a treatment option as if the parents were a malignant growth. And this was fueled even more by the psychiatric literature in the concept called the psychosomatic family. And in the psychosomatic family, the teenage, generally girl, was labeled as spoiled and manipulative. The mother was put down as smothering and emotionally over-involved. The father was withdrawn or absent. And the family dynamics were interesting in that the individuals developed their identities very poorly. And because there's poor identity formation, the boundaries between individuals were crossed or blurred or non-existent. And then family dynamics in this mess were described as enmeshed and conflict avoidant and triangulated in power struggles and unhealthy alliances. And I think the word that kind of pulls this all together was a sentence that I read in an academic journal written by a child and adolescent psychiatrist who was very well known at the time, who wrote, the referral of a patient with an eating disorder to a colleague is not viewed as a friendly act. So, as a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist, I sense that, wait a minute, maybe it's not the cause. Maybe what I'm seeing is not the cause. Maybe it's the result of having an eating disorder disrupting adolescent development and family life. So, I chose to listen to patients and believe them until I had reason not to. And I was, again, told, wait a minute, you have to watch out. These people lie, manipulate, etc. But how can I establish a relationship with a patient that's therapeutic when I assume that I can't trust them, when I have to feel that by their very nature, they're going to lie to me in order to not gain weight. Well, if you can't form a therapeutic relationship with a patient, well, why are you doing what you're doing? So I naively kind of just said, okay, I'll listen to what you, what you tell me, but trust and verify. And I had a friend, colleague, who is a therapist for adults, who reminded me of an experience that he had. He visited a patient in a psychiatric inpatient unit. He was an outpatient therapist. And she said, you know, nobody here trusts me. They call me devious. They call me manipulative. They don't believe a word I say, but you're different. When I tell you something, you believe me. And he very calmly said, I reserve the right to believe you even when you lie to me. For me, that was a seismic shift in attitude from my previous schooling. And so, coming to Rochester to study the biopsychosocial model, which talks about adolescents and parents in concert, there's a, the environment that a person grows up in is important, and so that actually the patient's and parent's subjective experience is considered just as important as the objective experience that I have from my physical examination and history. So it's not one or the other, it's we work together, we provide a partnership. And so now what I'd like to do is kind of look at the developmental factors that I think are embedded in adolescent development, but also embed in anorexia nervosa. So the first developmental task is puberty. So between 10 and 20 years of age, the vast majority of individuals go through puberty, girl to woman, boy to man, and that is a permanent transformative change. You're a different person after you go through puberty. And there's now research that shows that sex hormones, depending on where they occur in the, source of, in the course of pubertal development, have a modulating a factor, modulating an effect on factors known to be affect either genetic or environmental factors. So, puberty is an important part 
of the development of anorex nervosa. It kind of forms the foundation for the emergence and progression. Identity, that's the second major task of adolescence. Uh, I know when I was studying adolescent development, I learned about Eric Erickson's theory of human development. And in adolescent phase, it was you either came with a stable, st stable sense of self or you had role confusion or role diffusion. Well, this is a drawing by Sherry, a 15-year-old patient, who she had to, drew a, um, had to make a drawing for show and tell at school. And this is her self-portrait. Pretty striking. And she said, I need to feel like I'm a superwoman on the outside, but inside I feel like an empty shell. And I asked her why she was kind of from the head down to the torso, her right and left shifted from superwoman to skeletal self. And she said, because my sense of self is always changing. But her sense of self was also determined by the food that she was eating. There was no fat, no meat. The fork is overturned. She's clearly done with her meal. Just beyond arm's reach are the forbidden foods of cookies, cakes, pie, candy, ice cream. The clock on the wall always reads dinner time. And the shelf on the wall has jump rope for exercise and diet books, all focused on the identity of thinness. The third developmental task is the development of autonomy. I think for many adolescents, I know when I was an adolescent, autonomy was really the main thing that I was shooting for, how to have a sense of control. People can't tell me what to do. And when we think about autonomy development and, and how adolescents have to kind of gain their autonomy, we can talk about things like graduated curfews or graduated driver's licenses or restricted access to things like voting or smoking or alcohol, all of which are seen as a restriction of an adolescent's autonomy. But the problem with people with anorexia nervosa is they don't have a sense of control in their life. They don't have a sense of autonomy. And so it's a strange thing because where some adolescents might gain a sense of autonomy, sense of control by sex, drugs, and rock and roll, these patients don't have that option available to them. So in a strange way, limiting your caloric intake, being defined by what's on this, what the scale says you are, and, and the number of calories that you eat actually makes sense. Especially if you're talking about an individual who has fairly rigid thinking and is perfectionistic. Also risk avoidant and harm aversive. Those are all phrases that are used in describing patients with anorexia nervosa. But when you think about it, if that's what you're struck by, if that's what you're limited by, not having a sense of control, then actually determining what you eat, what goes into your mouth, actually is the ultimate sense of autonomy. And then there's also the issue of thinking. So we now know from neuroscience that the tremendous changes that happen between 10 and 25 years of age in brain development are due to connections being made and lost and different kinds of circuits being established. And especially with respect to the thinking in anorexia nervosa, what the patient, what the individual with anorexia nervosa does is very, I'd like to point out to patients, it's very, very, very logical. If you believe that you have no control in your life other than your weight, well, I'll control my weight. That will give me a sense of control. So the problem is not that it's illogical, the problem is that it's very logical, but they start with a false conclusion. The only thing I can control is my weight. So when I'm working with patients, I say, well, first of all, your thinking gets screwy when you don't eat very well. So I really focus on food and feeding the brain as a way of beginning uh, recovery. And so I'd like to leave you with an image this was a ceiling tile. I asked patients to draw something to leave for the next patient with a ceiling, with a, with a message of hope. And I see some people craning their heads. Try to look at it upright. And what it says is, where hope grows, miracles blossom. And I'm looking at this upside down when I'm getting ready to go to the patient's room who drew this. And I say, oh, well, it's interesting. You know, there's an aster and maybe some daffodils and some roses and different kinds of things. Oh, that looks pretty good. But after I went in to talk to her, 
I came out, and here was the image that I saw as it's on its head. And I wonder how many people saw what you might see now, especially if you consider in the middle the aster is a mouth, and two of the leaves are an eye and an eyebrow. And I hope that my short presentation today helps you to realize that when we consider things a ment when we consider anorexia nervosa a mental illness, we very much restrict and limit the possibility of using a developmental framework in a biopsychosocial model. And so what I hope to do is to have us all start to, when we're thinking about treating eating disorders, think about the influence of puberty and the sexual maturation to a woman and adult. Think about the various issues in identity formation. Think about the tumultuous ride on autonomy development, and also the thinking changes that would continue on into the 25, 25 years of age or more. And I think with this kind of an approach, where we are not talking about something as a mental illness, but as a developmental process, that what you're doing actually makes perfect sense, I think we'll be able to have a much better outcome with treating patients. A, we can get them earlier in pediatrics, and B, I think there will also be less of a blaming and shaming area. And I try to be positive with my patients, and I had one patient who was, she had a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of obsessive compulsive traits, perfectionism, that comes with the territory. And I said to her, you know, you are fertile soil for anorexia nervosa because you're a hardworking person who has perfectionistic goals, you really want to do what's well, you are risk avoidant, you're harm avoidant, you tend to be a little bit anxious, you worry about things, you tend to get depressed, and I said, and for that reason, you are fertile soil on the, for the eating disorder to develop. However, I also think you have many strengths that you will be able to overcome the eating disorder that you have now. And so I said, you know, the seeds of recovery are within you. And without dropping a beat, she said to me, yeah, and you're the fertilizer. I took that as the greatest compliment. Thank you. So you really emphasize the importance of understanding the whole person in yes. your work, specifically with eating disorders. Do you think that there are similar benefits to be had by applying the same approach to mental illness, for lack of a better term, in general? Absolutely. Well, the biopsychosocial model is very interesting. It was established 40 years ago in Rochester by a psychiatrist who was an internist. And he said, I can't figure out how to help these people by using an internal medicine model. So the biopsychosocial model is back and forth. It's all different levels, and they interact with each other. It's highly dynamic. It's highly ecological. And I think we need to apply that to everything. So once you know someone's story, their personal story, you know much more about them than when you check off boxes in a, in a, you know, in a survey, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I really talk to patients and tell me your story. And I believe it helps me to understand them and them to understand me. And I think it's easier to form a partnership in that kind of situation. All right. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>